So we have around 40 people so far. We can give it another minute. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Wait, wait. I mean, we're about to get more. Okay. Okay. Okay, we're live. Okay. Shall we make a start? Yes. Yeah. Good. Okay. I'm glad to welcome you all to um, this uh, joint series on advanced political economy. This is the um, sessions that begin in the new year. So it's a new year. You're all welcome to the continuation of the series. And I'm even more pleased to welcome Sarah Stavano to do today's um, uh, seminar. Sarah is a <clears throat> colleague of mine at SOAS. She is a senior lecturer in economics. Um, she's worked at other places before coming to SOAS, but she's been at SOAS for a while and she is a, um, a SOAS stalwart. Seeing as she seeing as she studied the source. Um, Sarah is a political economist that focuses on development, development issues, and also uh, feminist uh, issues, feminist uh, questions. In particular, she works on um, work, labor, um, gender issues uh, to do with work and labor. Um, inequalities more broadly, social reproduction associated with that. And furthermore, she works on questions of food, questions of nutrition, questions of, um, you know, well-being and healthy that way, I suppose, although she's not a health economist, but she works on food and, and nutrition. So that's related to it. She specializes in geographical terms on Africa. That's us. We usually have 
area specializations. So she works on Africa, and in particular, she works on Mozambique and Ghana. Um, and again, at SOAS, this means that um, she has been there and knows what they're like. And um, um, she has fieldwork uh, experience. Um, Sarah is also interdisciplinary in her approach, consciously so, and in her research methods, attempting to mix quantitative with qualitative research and get more powerful results in political economy. And she's looking for bridging micro and macro, but not in the way of the neoclassicals, uh, in the way of the political economists, which is uh, far more promising and far more interesting than, um, as I say, the orthodox mainstream way of doing it. She's published widely in the main, uh, essentially non-mainstream journals. And um, I firmly believe that she's one of the people who is going to um, shape political economy in these directions uh, in the years to come. Uh, anyway, quite apart from what I believe, Sarah will talk today about uh, gender reproduction, uh, unpaid labor, and particularly food and nutrition, um, the kinds of things that she specializes in. And she will lead us uh, into these topics, uh, following which we will have a discussion and question and answer session in the usual way. So without further ado, Sarah, you've got the floor. Thank you so much, Costas. And I know it's a cliche to thank the person who's just introduced the speaker for the very generous introduction, but I do think you were incredibly generous. Um, so thanks for that. Uh, and uh, I would like to start by saying that I am incredibly pleased to be given the opportunity to take part uh, in uh, this lecture series uh, to discuss uh, political economy with all of you. And of course, political economy is at the core of my uh, interests. Um, but it's also very nice uh, and heartwarming to see the two PhD student communities uh, of uh, the economics department at SOAS uh, and at the new school to come together uh, around this series. Uh, and uh, I also would like to thank, to thank all of uh, the people involved in the organization um, I think this is, uh, this is really great, and I hope that there is a lot more that is going to come out of uh, this uh, lecture series. Uh, um, so if you just give me a second, I'm going to start uh, sharing my screen, because I've prepared some slides. I hope that you can see my screen fine. So, of course, as mentioned, uh, today's lecture is going to be on uh, social reproduction and labor, and I am very delighted to be talking about these topics, uh, which are really at the core of my uh, research interests. In fact, I think I have uh, become uh, interested in labor, so my interest in labor sort of precedes that uh, in social reproduction, in that uh, I've always been uh, uh, interested in uh, work from a feminist perspective, but uh, I have uh, become familiar with uh, social reproduction frameworks and more specifically only in the past uh, uh, four to five years or so. Um, and, uh, and I think that there is a lot of incredibly exciting and promising scholarship uh, that is uh, taking place now as we speak in the field of social reproduction. Uh, so I'm hoping to share some of this with you today, uh, but of course, uh, uh, also providing some of uh, the historical uh, origins uh, of uh, social reproduction and why it is uh, particularly important, I think, uh, in political economy. Um, before we get there, I wanted to start uh, with a couple of uh, illustrations uh, on uh, where we are uh, today uh, in our capitalist life. Um, so what you see on this slide is the heading uh, of, uh, or the headline, um, of an article published in uh, June 2022 in uh, the Financial Times, um, which is about uh, the global crisis in nursing. Um, so the article says that in 2020, the World Health Organization estimated that there was a global shortage of almost 6 million nurses. 
Um, and there are variations in terms of where the, how these shortages are distributed across the world, uh, but these uh, shortages are particularly uh, uh, intense and particularly high in the low and middle income nations in Africa, in Latin America, in Southeast Asia, and in the Eastern Mediterranean regions. Uh, um, which you know immediately made me think of uh, some feminist work, uh, particularly on uh, the out migration of nurses uh, from countries such as South Africa, uh, looking for jobs in uh, countries uh, where pay is uh, higher. And I'm thinking here of uh, the very nice work I highly recommend by Salima Valiani. Um, but the article doesn't talk about the social reproduction. Uh, but when I read it, I was uh, very interested in it because uh, the global nursing crisis uh, is a prime example of a problematic that feminists uh, have been concerned with uh, for a very long time, which is uh, the systematic uh, squeeze and devaluation of social reproduction in capitalist societies. And in fact, the article goes on to say that the main reasons why nurses uh, are leaving their jobs are lack of recognition and appreciation, high workloads uh, resulting in burnout uh, and mental health uh, problems. Um, and of course, uh, this is an article that, uh, and this is a story that uh, emerged uh, particularly strongly on uh, the mainstream uh, media as well, um, uh, and news outlets uh, in uh, the, almost the aftermath uh, of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. But as it happened with many other dimensions of capitalist life, the shortage of nurses predates the COVID-19 pandemic, but was exacerbated and amplified by the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, so this leads me to just mention a few words uh, on the COVID-19 pandemic and the crisis that has been associated with this. Um, which is another illustration of where we are in uh, the organization of capitalist life. So uh, the COVID-19 pandemic has been defined as a crisis like no other by Alessandra Mezzadri, who is uh, in development studies here at SOAS, uh, because uh, it is a crisis uh, that uh, simultaneously disrupted both the social reproduction and production. Um, and it is not surprising that a lot of feminist interventions have been made on the COVID-19 pandemic, because I do think that feminist approaches offer a very powerful uh, analytical uh, lens to understand the COVID-19 pandemic. And this is because the pandemic exposed how the hidden abode of production is not only within the labor process uh, meant uh, within the employment relationship, but it encompasses the work and the material practices of social reproduction as a whole. So uh, caring responsibilities within the home shaped how people were impacted by the pandemic, uh, the confinement of social reproduction within the home exposed how social reproduction takes place across uh, the entire society, uh, in families, uh, in communities, uh, and through the public provision of services as well. Um, so if anything, we have uh, uh, sort of rediscovered uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic uh, that households and families uh, are very key sites for social reproduction, but they are in fact uh, completely insufficient uh, to meet all of the needs of social reproduction. And together with some colleagues here at SOAS uh, and beyond uh, the Open University, we have written, for example, a conceptual piece uh, uh, that you can see on the slide. But so this is to show why I think that an interest in social reproduction is uh, um, resurfacing as we speak. Um, because I think that uh, we are uh, experiencing uh, some uh, situations and circumstances in the organization of capitalist life uh, that are uh, best uh, understood uh, or more fully understood uh, through a social reproduction lens. Uh, 
So to come to the outline of uh, my talk today, I would like to start uh, uh, briefly by uh, interrogating uh, the meaning of social reproduction. So what is social reproduction? Then I want to talk briefly about the debates on value generation from uh, the 1970s to today, as I think that these were foundational uh, to uh, the contemporary uh, renewed interest in social reproduction. So I want to trace uh, very briefly that kind of genealogy um, and then I want to talk about uh, uh, the long-term squeeze of social reproduction, particularly uh, through the concept uh, of crisis of social reproduction that has been uh, uh, very much taken up in feminist scholarship and beyond at the moment. And in the final part, uh, I will focus on social reproduction and labor. So particularly how a social reproduction approach enriches our understanding of work. And I will provide here an illustration from Mozambique, which is a country that I do research on since 2010, and I'm very interested in. And I want to mention that uh, the content of this talk uh, draws on a chapter on social reproduction in uh, a forthcoming book uh, that will be published uh, later this year on a feminist political economy, a global perspective, uh, which I have co-authored with uh, Sara Cantillon from Glasgow Caledonian University and Odile Market from Bits University. So starting with uh, what is a social reproduction? So the meaning of social reproduction. Um, the concept originates at the beginning of the second wave of feminism. Uh, and it is widely used, particularly uh, by Marxist and socialist feminists uh, in the 1970s uh, and 80s. Uh, and I think it is important to recognize uh, right from the start uh, um, that uh, the notion of social reproduction comes from a cross-disciplinary or even interdisciplinary engagement uh, across the social sciences. Uh, so I think that uh, the notion is uh, very useful in political economy, but we need to recognize uh, how uh, it has a place uh, also in other disciplines uh, such as uh, geography, sociology, uh, politics uh, and uh, you know the constellation basically of the social sciences. Um, so in this sense, uh, uh, it is a useful framework uh, to uh, connect or even reconnect uh, economic analysis uh, to other social sciences. Um, and the concept is uh, fundamentally Marxist uh, in that it comes from Marxist own work. Um, however, where Marx refers uh, to uh, reproduction as the reproduction of capitalist relations of production, um, then uh, the body of work on social reproduction is based uh, on a number of uh, very significant feminist extensions uh, of this concept. Um, so to highlight what I think are some of the most important extensions so from a feminist perspective, the first is to recognize that the activities that are needed to reproduce life, both on a daily and intergenerational basis, um, are part of uh, the process of social reproduction and they are to be considered as forms of work. So this very much goes uh, also into those debates uh, that uh, um, um, help us classify what is considered to be work and non-work within capitalism. So feminists uh, have been uh, engaging with uh, these debates uh, very productively. Um, the second feminist extension is uh, um, that centering social reproduction uh, is important uh, to uh, sort of put on the table, to so place the emphasis uh, on gender inequality in addition to or even co-constituted with uh, class inequality. See, this was uh, another uh, feminist intervention that was made uh, in dialogue uh, with uh, uh, Marxist uh, intellectuals uh, and uh, uh, Marxist uh, um, uh, activists uh, in uh, more broadly um, to sort of, uh, uh, without sort of actually, but to put forward the basic point that we cannot focus only on class inequality, but we also need to consider gender inequality. And in fact, it's the, perhaps the co-constitution of the two within capitalism that is of specific interest to Marxist feminists. Um, and the contemporary social reproduction feminism um, 
which, you know, broadly speaking, I think that uh, uh, this uh, renewed interest needs to be credited to uh, particularly the work by Liz Vogel and how it has been uh, taken up by people uh, like Titi Bhattacharya, Cinzia Ruzza and Sue Ferguson in particular. But of course, then now there is a, a proliferation of work using social reproduction frameworks that goes beyond these authors as well. But I think that they have been at the forefront of reviving an interest in social reproduction. So these more contemporary approaches are concerned with multiple forms or uh, sort of intersecting or co-constituted forms of oppression and exploitation. And I will say a little bit more about this later. Um, uh, but I think from my uh, viewpoint uh, that uh, uh, this line of work uh, is very promising and a social reproduction lens uh, can be very powerful uh, to advance uh, this agenda um, indeed. So to provide, uh, uh, to share a definition uh, with you on uh, uh, of social reproduction, uh, there are many, but one that I very much like because I find it very uh, encompassing and uh, touching upon a number of important elements uh, of social reproduction is that by geographer Cindy Katz. Um, so you can see it on the slide, but I will read it out loud. Um, syndicates define, defines a social reproduction as the fleshy, messy, and indeterminate stuff of everyday life, uh, but also as a set of structured practices so that unfold uh, in dialectical relation with production, with which uh, social reproduction is uh, mutually constitutive uh, and intention. So, just to highlight a couple of important reasons so why I think this uh, type of definition and conceptualization of a social reproduction is quite powerful and useful. Um, first, uh, because it points uh, to the inseparability of the reproduction of human life uh, and the reproduction of capitalist relations uh, within uh, capitalism. And I think this also points uh, to a key underpinning tension in uh, the notion of social reproduction that is not always uh, captured uh, um, in, uh, in the literature. And second, uh, um, the idea of the mutual constitution and tension between production and social reproduction is incredibly helpful because it's, I, I understand how there is a, perhaps a bit of a danger um, by talking about social reproduction um, in uh, uh, sort of pointing to the existence of separate spheres, capitalist production on the one hand as a sphere and social reproduction on the other hand as a separate sphere. But in fact, I find that the work uh, uh, conducted through a social reproduction lens uh, is precisely about uh, dismantling that uh, dichotomous idea of uh, two separate spheres. And it is about uh, understanding uh, that mutual con constitution and tension, um, where there are in fact uh, many uh, gray areas uh, and areas of overlap. Um, so, in this sense, I find very useful the kind of uh, uh, definition uh, that Winders and Smith in this paper published in 2019 have put forward uh, in terms of what does it mean uh, to look at capitalism from a social reproduction perspective. And uh, what they say is that uh, uh, taking a social reproduction approach uh, is essentially about uh, analyzing the articulations uh, between a capitalist production and the social reproduction. And uh, uh, there, are, there is not one monolithic way of doing this uh, in a feminist scholarship, but there have been different ways uh, or different imaginaries, uh, as, they, as they put it, um, which are really about understanding how uh, these domains uh, um, uh, interact uh, and articulate uh, with uh, uh, each other. Um, and do keep in mind uh, this idea of imaginary and uh, the articulation of uh, capitalist production and social reproduction, because I will uh, be coming back to this later. But moving on to the second part of this, very briefly on a genealogy of uh, social reproduction debates, uh, uh, starting with uh, the domestic labor debate of the 1970s, uh, 
which was a very foundational debate, I think, in feminist, in particularly in Marxist feminist thinking, but also beyond. So essentially, um, these feminists uh, um, represented in, on this slide by uh, probably the most influential intervention at the time, uh, um, uh, which is this pamphlet, uh, uh, The Power of Women and the Subversion of the Community, offered by Maria Rosa Dalla Costa and Selma James. Uh, essentially, they took issue with uh, the naturalization of uh, women's domestic labor and the role of women as housewives. So, so they were motivated by making an intervention that was about uh, um, denaturalizing uh, this type of work and uh, also the role of the housewife. Um, so they put forward this idea that uh, um, housewives uh, produce uh, use values uh, for household consumption, but they also, this is their focus, so they uh, uh, produce uh, a special commodity, which is labor power. And so labor power, this of course doesn't come from, there, from them, but it comes uh, directly from Marx, uh, uh, is a special commodity because it creates uh, more value when it is uh, productively consumed uh, by the capitalists. And so this uh, point uh, is taken up uh, by these feminists uh, to essentially suggest uh, that uh, um, therefore, because uh, housewives uh, are pivotal, are the most important uh, uh, figure to produce the labor power, then by adding that extra, you know, logical step in the middle, then housework uh, is a type of work that is uh, itself uh, value producing. Um, and this created a lot of controversy, and uh, in fact, these controversies are not resolved today, and uh, they attracted a lot of uh, debate, uh, both uh, within uh, uh, the field or the area of Marxist thinking, but also within feminism, um, more or less uh, uh, related to uh, Marxist political economy. Um, I'm not going to go into that, because it's a little bit beyond what I'm trying to do here, but uh, I think what is important to highlight is that this intervention was, uh, I think, primarily a political intervention. And uh, the big uh, political implication of this work is that uh, essentially the wageless housewife uh, becomes uh, a political subject that is not irrelevant uh, or marginal to class struggle, but in fact is quite central to it. And uh, this political message uh, was uh, taken up and embodied uh, in uh, the Wages for Housework campaign, um, which was, again, a campaign that generated a lot of controversy. Um, and uh, uh, the campaign was about uh, uh, exposing the exploitation of women as wageless uh, housewives uh, and uh, denaturalizing uh, domestic labor by calling for a wage uh, to be uh, paid for domestic labor. Now, uh, without uh, going into you know, all of the debates, I do want to highlight uh, some important uh, criticism uh, that was uh, raised uh, within uh, uh, feminism, but also from black Marxism. And uh, uh, I think uh, perhaps one uh, um, powerful um, intervention was uh, that uh, by Angela Davis uh, in uh, this uh, wonderful book, Women, Race and Class. We're basically looking at the US context. Uh, Angela Davis uh, points out uh, that working class uh, women, uh, black and white immigrant women um, were primarily wage earners uh, in the labor market uh, and also in other people's households. So this is to say the concept of the wageless housewife uh, as uh, the primary role of women is uh, very far from being universal. And second, uh, the household is not only a site of unpaid labor, but it's a side of uh, underpaid uh, labor uh, for many uh, women. Um, and sort of in a very different way, but uh, uh, also taking forward uh, a more uh, sophisticated idea of the household as a space of uh, uh, work and production, uh, in addition to reproduction. 
the work of uh, Maria Mies uh, um, has uh, highlighted how the household is a site where we see a conflation of uh, productive and reproductive work. Um, so if we want to map it onto the imaginaries uh, set out by Winders and Smith uh, that I mentioned before, this uh, would fall in the uh, category of uh, overlapping articulations of capitalist production and social reproduction. And so Mies uh, traces a parallel between uh, the colonization as a process that underpinned the international division of labor and the process of uh, housewifeization, which I managed to say correctly, which is great, uh, is the one that structures uh, the household division of labor. And how, therefore, the household, again, similar to Angela Davis, uh, but focused on very different contexts. And in the case of Mies, uh, she was looking, among other things, at lace makers uh, in India. In fact, there is a lot of capitalist production that takes place in the home, but so through the uh, sort of spatial uh, relegation of uh, this type of uh, wage labor within uh, the confines of uh, the home, we see how this work uh, is made uh, invisible and uh, devalued. Um, so this imaginary of uh, overlapping spheres uh, has been uh, taken up by social reproduction theory, which is uh, one uh, important strand of uh, contemporary social reproduction thinking, and one that, uh, as I was mentioning earlier, I um, mostly um, uh, ref refer to as uh, being uh, constituted by a group of scholars uh, such as uh, Titi Bhattacharya, Cinzia Ruzza, and uh, Sue Ferguson, um, most importantly, I would say. Um, and social reproduction theory essentially seeks to develop an, integ an integrative theorization of labor in capitalist production and social reproduction uh, that goes uh, beyond the domestic space. Uh, um, and so, uh, Social reproduction theory is uh, interested in understanding how categories of oppression are co-produced in simultaneity with uh, the production of surplus value. Uh, then there is this jargon of uh, life making activities on the one hand and profit making activities on the other hand, where life making activities of social reproduction are somehow influenced by capital, but they're not entirely controlled by it. Um, and uh, social reproduction theory uh, theorizes the production of labor as the production of use value, uh, therefore as a non-capitalist uh, and non-value generating form of work. So you see that here there is a departure from uh, the feminist uh, intervention in the domestic labor debate and one that has been taken up uh, critically by other feminists, uh, most notably by Alessandra Mezzadri, um, who essentially has engaged, uh, uh, you know, has engaged uh, productively with social reproduction theory in that uh, there is a, a lot of, uh, there are a lot of synergies, uh, but also critically uh, with it, uh, based on the fact that uh, uh, social reproduction theory's understanding of value suffers from a productivist bias. Uh, that, according to Mezzadri, may hide uh, the work of women, the poor, and the wageless uh, in the vast informal economies of uh, the Global South. So it is a perspective that is informed uh, um, by uh, trying to understand uh, the functioning of uh, contemporary capitalism um, in uh, uh, contexts uh, uh, from the Global South uh, or also called uh, the majority world. Um, so having gone through this uh, uh, quite briefly, I want to move to the third part, which is uh, that on uh, uh, this key concept of crisis of social reproduction. So I think that the most important work in uh, defining what a crisis of social reproduction is, uh, is to be attributed to Nancy Fraser who essentially has pointed out how capitalism has an intrinsic social reproductive crisis tendency or contradiction, because although social reproduction is necessary, is a necessary condition for capital accumulation, capitalism squeezes and destabilizes the processes of social reproduction. And so Fraser um, 
uh, describes how in different capitalist regimes, uh, such as liberal state managed uh, and the current regime, uh, which is financialized, uh, social reproduction is organized in specific ways. So without going through all of them now, um, but uh, in the interest of time, focusing on uh, the current regime of financialized capitalism, social reproduction is uh, uh, essentially organized in a dual way where it is uh, commodified on the one hand for those who can pay for it uh, and privatized for those uh, who cannot, which uh, clearly has uh, immediately an implication for uh, inequalities uh, and how inequalities are reproduced. Uh. Um, and also she adds that the modern ideal of the dual earner family conceals uh, the growing precarity and instability of a global labor market that uh, effectively cannot create jobs so that pay living wages uh, and offer decent working conditions. Uh, um, and, you know, of course, uh, this has to do with the labor market transformations uh, that uh, are now of interest uh, to the entire globe. And uh, as uh, uh, alongside this, uh, we have uh, that social spending is being rolled back, uh, then uh, that becomes a key channel for households uh, to access social provisioning. And these, of course, are links uh, to the literature on household indebtedness and financialization through the integration of households uh, into financial uh, circuits. Uh, um, but essentially, um, beyond uh, this uh, general characterization of uh, uh, the idea of a crisis tendency within capitalism that has to do with uh, the squeeze of social reproduction, um, I think that uh, it is also helpful to think more specifically about uh, processes uh, that uh, are that might lead to these points of crisis. Uh, and I think that more um, work and in particular feminist work uh, might be needed in these areas. Uh, so here um, I think an important piece of work uh, that focuses on uh, the specific phase of neoliberal globalization is uh, that uh, uh, by Isabella Bakker and uh, Stephen Gill who have put forward the idea of uh, privatization or in fact reprivatization of social reproduction as a pivotal to the deepening of exploitative processes uh, during uh, neoliberalism. And they have highlighted four key shifts uh, that happen in this time. One is that uh, households' responsibilities for social reproduction intensify, and at the same time, components of social reproduction work become increasingly commodified. The second shift is that societies are increasingly atomized and devoid of a sense of the collective. The third is that capital penetration moves away from formal employment relations to everyday life through the erosion of social provisioning. And the fourth is that survival and social reproduction are increasingly determined by market forces. So it's this idea that social reproduction is left increasingly uh, in the hands of uh, essentially families uh, um, as uh, you know the state uh, there is a shift away from uh, the provisioning role of the state uh, and how there is at the same time an encroachment of capital into social reproduction um, and I think you know, this for me, you know, coming across this work was uh, very important. I think it captures uh, uh, important processes, uh, particularly in some contexts uh, of the global north. Uh, but uh, since then, I think that there has been uh, more work of trying to uh, think about these trajectories uh, also in other parts of the world. And when it comes uh, to, broadly speaking, the global south, uh, I don't think that there is a sort of systematic piece of uh, theorization of these processes yet, um, but there are uh, different pieces of work uh, that uh, generate uh, very important insights uh, to think about uh, these trajectories, particularly during the phase of neoliberalism. Um, and uh, the starting point is that uh, there are many contexts uh, in the majority world uh, where the provision of social reproduction was always uh, largely private uh, in that it was in the hands of families. Uh, um, so even at points uh, when the state was a bit bigger in the 50s and 60s, uh, the state never uh, took up a very significant chunks of the social reproduction work. Uh, 
And so focusing on the shift away from the public to the private in this context doesn't make a lot of sense. And uh, so what might be more useful is to focus on the changing conditions of social reproduction. And uh, for example, there has been uh, some work uh, in the context of Mexico where uh, the patterns of migration have led to the increasing importance of remittances uh, to social reproduction. Uh, but in parallel, these migration uh, patterns, uh, in this case, uh, mostly transnational migration, have uh, led to this location, which has in turn eroded uh, important social networks uh, that are at the basis of social reproduction. And in a similar but also different way, uh, in the context of Mozambique, I think that what we see is essentially a fragmentation of the kinship uh, or extended family, um, which complicates uh, the temporal and special dynamics uh, of uh, social reproduction that remains largely family-centered, uh, except that today families uh, no longer necessarily live in the same place. And uh, some other scholarship from uh, various contexts of the Global South uh, has also highlighted the centrality of land to uh, social reproduction. So where agricultural production and the unpaid gendered labor that is associated with it are essential for the social reproduction of the rural poor in India, for example, but also how the social cultural relations that are related to ownership of and access to land are central to the ceremonial economy. What is the ceremonial economy? Essentially the economy that is composed of uh, the rituals and ceremonies uh, such as initiation rites, uh, weddings and funerals. Uh, which, why is it an economy? Because uh, there are often economic obligations uh, that uh, are important in sustaining uh, these ceremonies. Uh, and these uh, economic obligations and the participation in these ceremonies uh, is uh, um, not at all trivial. It is absolutely essential in order to ensure membership to specific social groups. And uh, uh, it is uh, through uh, that uh, connection also essentially a social safety net. Uh, and this has been uh, documented uh, very well for the region of Southern Africa, for example. Um, but uh, moving uh, uh, towards the last part of this, which is about the social reproduction and labor, and I will pick up some of these ideas again in just a second. Um, this is essentially a body of work uh, um, that uh, uh, has been uh, trying to understand how we can use a social reproduction lenses uh, to uh, better understand the work. And I would point you to uh, a nice uh, collection of papers uh, published the special issue recently in the review um, uh, of uh, international political economy, uh, which provide uh, a very nice uh, illustration through very interesting uh, and rich, uh, both uh, empirically and theoretically, uh, case studies uh, on this. This work essentially builds on uh, early feminist analysis of employment at the time of neoliberal globalization. And uh, this work was very much concerned with the risks of the double burden. So what does it mean? It was concerned with uh, women's participation in uh, the labor market, particularly through the development of labor intensive export oriented industries in the global south but how this participation in uh, the labor market very often was not accompanied by a loss of responsibilities uh, in housework uh, or in care work, for example. And so there was always uh, the very tangible risk of a double burden for women. Now, a social reproduction approach uh, somehow takes uh, this agenda forward uh, by underlying the centrality of social reproduction to the very structuring of labor processes uh, and uh, uh, dynamics of exploitation. So in these terms, again, if we want to link it back uh, to those imaginaries uh, set out by Winders and Smith, um, it essentially means uh, seeing work through capitalist uh, production and social reproduction as equal and overlapping spheres, uh, focusing on what occurs uh, at the intersections. Um, what are, from my perspective, uh, the key contributions uh, to the conceptualization of work uh, in using a social reproduction lens? Uh, 
First, uh, that uh, social, reproduction, uh, social reproduction offers uh, a unifying lens for the analysis of uh, inequality, oppression, and exploitation. And this is really about uh, seeing the laboring classes uh, not as a homogeneous thing, but as uh, uh, differentiated and structured uh, on grounds of gender, race, ethnicity, migration status, and so on. Um, and where actually these power relations uh, are very important determinants uh, of the terms of uh, integration into capitalist production, as well as uh, marginalization in capitalist production or exclusions from uh, capitalist production. And the second key contribution is to basically use a social reproduction as a lens that can capture local global interrelations. So, so really connecting uh, the temporal and spatial dimensions of the everyday life at the micro level, if you want, with the macro structural processes uh, that uh, shape the functioning of uh, the global economy. So just to move briefly, uh, and I'm almost done, um, uh, on to you know, zooming in on Mozambique. Um, I think that uh, uh, trying to understand some of these issues, uh, and particularly the organization of life and work in Mozambique is incredibly valuable because it offers a perspective from the periphery of the periphery which is very neglected in economics and political economy, I think. So I just would like you to, uh, you know, I'm going to try to put it in very simple terms, but if you want to imagine what the organization on life and labor is for the vast majority of ordinary people in Mozambique, you need to imagine a very complex uh, reality where people are engaged in a variety of forms of self and wage employment, more or less regular type of work, um, farm and non-farm work. So, you know, it is not about basically having a nine to five jobs. And I think that we are beginning to see some of these dynamics towards informalization, casualization and so forth, also in countries in the global north. Um, but this constellation of this multiplicity of occupations uh, is absolutely needed because none of them pays uh, uh, a sufficient wage or uh, allows for earning uh, an income that is sufficient to make a living in the context of an increasingly commodified life. So in this context, the wage labor is neither dominant nor exclusive. And uh, what we have is that uh, people need to respond and address what uh, we can call social reproduction imperatives. And these social reproduction imperatives so that are things such as housework, food production for own consumption, various forms of care, and also taking part in ceremonies, so which is what I was referring to earlier, um, are very central to the social economic fabric. Um, and they do shape uh, the terms of engagement uh, with uh, remunerated work, uh, both in terms of type of work uh, and frequency. Um, and the imperatives of social reproduction are not very easy to be met, uh, and they are compounded uh, by broader systemic issues. So, for example, they are compounded by poor transport and road infrastructure, where many occupations so such as trading or petty commodity production that uh, are reliant on mobility, on the necessity to be mobile, um, are compounded by uh, the lack of good roads uh, or very poor transport infrastructure. And uh, this means uh, that uh, certain people with, uh, for example, high care responsibilities uh, are excluded from these types of occupation because uh, they just cannot take part uh, in this. Um, so the spatial reorganization of life uh, linked to recent and ongoing processes of urbanization also complicates uh, the provision of social reproduction, which remains a family center, but as I was alluding to before already, families now live in different places. Also, there are uh, specific uh, temporal dynamics, uh, both in the everyday and seasonally, that shape uh, the rhythms of work, 
um, that uh, come into uh, this uh, of work and life, of course, uh, and come into this picture in of like a very fragmented uh, uh, means uh, to address uh, the social reproduction imperatives. Uh, and particularly more formal workplaces. I'm not going to go into the very complicated issues of formal versus informal here, but uh, for example, in the context of more formal wage labor, very often employers uh, do not have an understanding on the, of the importance uh, for workers uh, to, part to be absent from work, uh, to participate in ceremonies, uh, which instead, as I was explaining earlier, is a key tenet of uh, social membership uh, and also access to social support. So in this sense, uh, um, I think that uh, we can uh, deduce uh, that uh, the means of social reproduction in peripheral economies so that are characterized uh, like Mozambique by narrow and extractive productive structures uh, uh, are increasingly fragmented uh, and uh, workers uh, and surplus labor, so labor as a whole, is trapped in forms of what I call precarious uh, uh, exploitative dynamism. So there is a lot that is happening. It's very dynamic, but it's all very precarious. Uh, and the conditions of both survival and exploitation rest on reproducing such dynamism. And in this sense, uh, um, I think very often, even when we want to include the social reproduction in our analysis, so we might see it uh, in a residual or subordinate position. I think that uh, in the periphery of the periphery, it is uh, almost the opposite. So social reproduction comes first. So it's not subordinate or residual to reproduction, but in fact is uh, the necessity for people to address the imperatives of social reproduction that conditions their participation in production with implications for labor productivity, for foreign capital volatility that uh, in a country like Mozambique is key to domestic processes of capital accumulation. So domestic capital accumulation is uh, very much dependent on uh, the inflow of FDIs. And so as also, of course, uh, the imperatives of social reproduction are not equally distributed, they reflect uh, power relations uh, along uh, the axis of gender, class, migration status, ethnicity, and so forth. Uh, and therefore, they're also the basis of the reproduction of marginalization and oppression. So on this note, um, I know that I've taken up probably a little bit too much time, but I'm just going to conclude with a brief summary of what I hope I have uh, put across uh, in these uh, 45 minutes or so. Um, so first, uh, we've seen how the origins of social reproduction as an area of feminist inquiry can be traced back to the 1970s, uh, in particular to the domestic labor debate uh, and uh, uh, its various uh, ramifications, uh, particularly in Marxist feminist thinking. Um, and after having been sidelined for a few decades, uh, uh, there is now renewed interest in social reproduction, uh, which is driven by the work of social reproduction feminists. Um, then feminist analysis uh, centered on social reproduction pointed to the ongoing crisis of social reproduction as processes that are intrinsic to capitalism and exacerbated by the privatization of social reproduction in the global north uh, and the fragmentation of the conditions of social reproduction in the global south. And finally, social reproduction frameworks uh, can be used to study labor processes, uh, work organization, and also to interrogate uh, the shifting boundaries of work and non-work. Um, and uh, uh, they can help us better understand the differentiation of classes of labor in relation to the location in uh, the global economy. So on this note, I hope that this was uh, sufficiently clear, not too overwhelming, uh, but thank you for the attention and I very much look forward to the interventions by Adam and Buthena and all of the questions and comments that people might have. Thank you, I'm going to stop sharing. Thank you, Sarah, for that. Um, my name is Adam Willman, um, and I will uh, be giving one of the PhD um, kind of presentations that goes along uh, with Sarah's wonderful lecture. Um, I will be explaining how my research is related to what Sarah just discussed. Um, 
it's not going to be direct, but uh, you can definitely see some themes that Sarah mentioned kind of in my research. So I have some slides that I will share. Can everybody uh, see that slide? Yep, okay, good. So first, my research focuses on the question, how do farmers make decisions and innovate, um, both on uh, their farm, but then also kind of in their, their livelihoods and in their daily lives. So I'm working with the Pesticide Action Network. They are a charity um, and network of charities uh, across the world that help to get uh, harmful pesticides out of agricultural production. So I'm working with the Pesticide Action Network both in the United Kingdom and in Ethiopia. Um, and I am started with yield data um, going back to 2014 from 21 different uh, farming locations. You can see them on the map. So this is in Southern Ethiopia along the uh, Western shoreline of those uh, two lakes. And I'm still determining in my quantitative analysis um, the variations in, in yields. Um, I believe most of them are due to seasonal changes. Um, however, I will kind of get into some of the um, socioeconomic changes that could also impact uh, the yields. Um, currently, there are three ways of farming that uh, um, we have categorized. So there's farmer practice or before um, any kind of agronomist or government official or charity comes in, um, to suggest different farming practices. So how it's been done um, traditionally or um, how they've been trained by other farmers. There's integrated pest management, which uses non-chemical um, solutions such as weeding or planting uh, trap crops, crops that attract a certain pest away from your, your main crop. Um, and certain sprays, food insect sprays that again will attract um, beneficial insects that will then go after the harmful pests. Uh, and then there are three production potentials, low, medium, and high. And it's important to note that cotton is not, is used as a cash crop um, alongside other plants and animals that um, these groups of farmers uh, raise for both domestic consumption and sale um, for their uh, family farms. So the first um, question that I wanted to know about was about resiliency. Um, so how do farmers uh, take changes from the local economy and environment and incorporate that into their decision-making on how they need to um, update or change their farming practices in order to um, reproduce themselves year after year after year, um, not just kind of increasing production, but make sure that they um, are able to uh, produce their livelihoods and, and continue within their communities. So recently in the past two growing, uh, past two years, um, it's been rather wet. In the southernmost lake on the map that I showed you actually flooded the cotton fields of uh, many of these farmers. So they were unable to grow cotton um, for the past two years as these uh, quotes kind of show. So one, uh, I, I can read them out loud. We didn't sow cotton this season, for example, as there was no rain during um, that month uh, that we normally sow cotton. But if you have a banana plantation, it would give you at least some yields. So this has led me into questions about resource distribution um, and ownership of land. So uh, I'm currently uh, investigating the ties between land ownership and yields and whether or not um, that has an impact on uh, production potential and uh, um, yields and income. So the other two quotes um, continue to go on like what happened this season, 2022, um, the shortage of rainfall aborted cotton seedlings in our village and we had to focus on other income sources. And we know the trend uh, of weather change from our fathers and forefathers and it will be good this season. So a little optimism at the end. This is mainly due to the fact that the rains have subsided and the lake has gone back to its normal um, watershed. So those fields have now sat fallow for two years um, underwater 
However, once drained, um, the farmers believe that they will uh, increase, it will increase the production potential from not having been planted the previous two years. So in the last couple of years, a farmer cooperative um, owned and operated by the farmers has um, popped up in one of the locations. Um, for the farmers, this provides F1 or first generation cotton seeds. Um, those cotton seeds can then be saved uh, after harvest, and um, that provides another source of income for the farmers. And they also do not have to buy cotton seed um, from the local traders, so increases um, a certain level of autonomy. They also provide loans to cover costs. Um, this is especially useful to hire labor during weeding, harvesting, and transporting. The weeding is the important uh, component here, mainly because uh, the production methods um, that these farmers are using, not using pesticides and herbicides, requires an increase um, in labor. So that means more um, person hours in the fields, um, you know, hand weeding or using machines to, to weed instead of passing through the fields um, with an herbicide. Storage um, of cotton for higher profit later in the season so that um, a lot of the farmers harvest cotton around the same time. So the price dips as there's um, a glut in the market uh, from the recent harvest. So allowing farmers to store that cotton and wait for a higher price um, is kind of a, a sort of savings account that the farmers use. Uh, this cooperative is uh, certified organic um, with the different farm fields also being certified. So there is a price premium that this specific group of farmers um, in this area receive that other farmers in my study do not receive. Um, and both um, the farmer cooperative and a couple other um, areas that have uh, contributed data through uh, farmer discussion groups have noticed that the cooperative has brought in opportunity to the area, but also competition into the local market. So um, having a farmer operated and owned cooperative has been beneficial um, to not just the farmers in the area, but also area farmers. However, um, those that are not in the cooperative also see it as a source of competition. So farmers not in the cooperative can still buy seed from the cooperative. Um, however, they don't have the option to, let's say, store um, the uh, cotton lint after harvest. So they receive some of the benefits, but, but not all. So as I mentioned, um, there has been an increase in income through the sale of cotton lint and seed with the cooperative. Um, and these two, the two quotes from the farmers that I have uh, down there just talk about how that money is used to buy and supplement um, things from everyday household items um, and uh, things that are used for other economic activities. So expanding economic activities. Um, through different revenue streams. Uh, there's also the reduced illness uh, and environmental contamination from pesticides. So uh, with these farmers not using harmful pesticides uh, and herbicides, insecticides, fungicides, all of those, um, they have been reporting uh, that they are sick less often. And those, the farmers that, the 31.8% of farmers that had experienced symptoms of pesticide poisoning in the previous 12 months from that 2013 study, um, those symptoms are, are quite severe and can be debilitating. Um, and the chemicals uh, that they are using are also linked to long-term um, uh, health impacts, mainly cancer. Uh, so not using these pesticides um, reduces their time that they are in the hospital or unable to work due to um, pesticide poisoning. And as I mentioned, there's a slight increase in autonomy. I wanna be careful about saying this. Um, by no means have the farmers by forming a cooperative broken away um, from some of the, the control and influence of the uh, larger corporations that sell seeds and buy cotton lint. However, the cooperative has provided them with some extra bargaining power and some extra tools and resources that they can use to get um, a fairer deal um, and, and better outcomes 
uh, from seed saving and, and being able to do their own storage and, and set their uh, own prices within the co-op. So um, from what Sarah talked about in her presentation, I have used uh, social reproductive labor theories in both the framework and the outset of setting up this research, and I'm also using it in the analysis. So one of the first things I wanted to do was identify the factors that influence change uh, with farmers. And I started focusing on the environmental factors first, um, but then it kind of started raising other issues and other questions. And as um, Sarah mentioned, it, it caused me to focus on the importance of ownership and access to resources. So the farmers in the cooperative um, are in a high production area. Um, their soil has decent fertility and they have access to irrigation, whereas other farm units and locations don't necessarily have uh, as good soil fertility, nor do they have access to irrigation. So those ideas of ownership and access to things that could improve resiliency on the farm have kind of become more and more um, top of my mind uh, as I've kind of progressed away from, from some of the environmental changes or, or am trying to get a deeper understanding of this. So um, clarification on land ownership and farm labor, um, access to certain resources, and then the idea of um, certification schemes within agriculture and agricultural consumption in the idea of um, instead of a global north or big corporations, the UN setting up these schemes and imposing them on local farmers if they were developed um, kind of at the base level and could uh, this cooperative make its own certification scheme and, and what would look like, what that would look like. And just some final thoughts. Um, I thought that this was uh, a good quote. Um, this farmer, she's from the uh, area that has the cooperative uh, and she makes the point that cotton welcomes babies into the world. A cotton cloth is used to wrap newborn babies, clothes us throughout life, and then helps us on our way out of this world as a cotton shroud is used to wrap the disease. So kind of going into that um, uh, ceremonial economy that Sarah talked about, um, I've, I've been able to, and I'm still working on it, but connect some of the environmental and um, impacts of the farm to some of the social economic uh, contributions. And so as I'm dicing and pairing these out, um, it's been interesting to see how the two influence each other and how an understanding of, of one uh, yields kind of a, a greater understanding of the other. So how social reproduction can be used in tandem um, with other theories and frameworks to provide a, a greater breadth and depth. Um, in research. So thank you very much. That's what I have. And uh, Buthena will be uh, speaking next about her research. Thank you, Adam, for that. And thank you, Sarah, for the very informative lecture. So I'm just going to share my screen at the moment as well. And can you all see it? Yeah. Okay, so today, so uh, as an introduction, my name is Bethany Mali, and I'm a PhD researcher at SOAS University of London. Today, I'm going to be presenting um, my study, which relates to uh, what uh, Dr. Sarah has already spoken about, um, particularly the reprivatization re of uh, social reproduction. And so my study looks at the care economy and how it relates to class inequality by looking at the case of Cairo. So before going into the study, I think it's important to acknowledge the difference between social reproduction and care work. Um, so the difference obviously varies between different fields. However, in this case, I view care work to be a subpart of social reproduction. Um, and I particularly choose to look at care work as a subpart of um, social reproduction, particularly because of how the methodology is, which is a bottom-up bottom uh, methodology, where um, I find that care work uh, 
um, plays a more pressuring role um, for women in Cairo specifically compared to other aspects of social reproduction. And in that way, I'm letting the data from fieldwork lead me into this analysis. So for this study, um, I will be drawing on the concept of free privatization of social reproduction, uh, which is something that uh, Dr. Sarah has uh, uh, explained in her lecture, um, which in this case is the reprivatization of care work. Um, so just as a quick overview of what this means, so reprivatization re refers to care work responsibility and social reproduction uh, responsibility more generally being shifted from the family to the state and then back to the family. So from the private sphere to the public sphere and then back to the private sphere. And this is definitely something that we can see happening in Egypt, where um, if we look at the colonial to post-colonial and then to new liberalism era, we can see a similar trend happening uh, with care work. So we find that care is part of the private sphere uh, during the colonial era. Uh, but then during the 50s and the 60s, where uh, there is an early independence period and we see the rise of state feminism um, happening, where... Um, where state feminism er emerged in efforts to liberate women and to um, encourage them to join the public sphere and in labor markets more generally, uh, we find that care work becomes more in the public sphere again by state. Um, however, back in the 70s, starting from the 70s, start of the new liberalism era, we find that there has been a shrinking role of the public sector and the state in general. And so we see that this responsibility of care work is pushed again to the private sphere and to the family. <clears throat> However, um, with Egypt, what we see is the private sphere goes beyond just the family. And from what we see during the field work is the emergence of the private sector. The private sector in this sense, meaning profit and non-profit uh, organizations and care institutions, along with the family. However, how we see care is organized in Egypt, especially in uh, recent years, is the shrinking reliance on the family, um, specifically on family and social networks, and um, especially in urban areas. And this is for multiple reasons, uh, including uh, many people live far away from their family homes, and due to the increase of nuclear families. Um, we also see that there is increase in awareness of, um, of the benefit that children get from nurseries and more market provided uh, care. And we also see that there is an increased increase need for mothers to join the labor force and to engage in paid work in order to, um, in order to afford the higher costs of living. Um, and so this, this uh, results from the fieldwork um, allows us to understand in a different sense what the reprivatization means and goes beyond simply just moving from family to state and to family again, but also to look at the private sector and the expansion of the private sector and the role it plays in social reproduction in this day and age. And so understanding that, we can also begin to understand how the privatization of care work also plays a role in the reproduction of inequality and the, the continued existence of inequality. And this is particularly because for Egypt is a very interesting case where it is illegal to hire migrant workers as domestic or care help. And so we find that many of the care, um, care workers, paid care workers in Egypt are often um, lower class local Egyptian women. And so we find that lower class women are more likely to work in underpaid and more precarious care jobs, also more informal care jobs. And um, this is both within the household, but also outside in the private, uh, in the market, uh, in the market provided care institutions where, for example, we begin to see that educated women from higher socioeconomic backgrounds 
have access to better working conditions and better and higher paying jobs in the care sector compared to um, women from lower class uh, backgrounds. And uh, yeah, so uh, with that being said, we began to see how care and the, and the privatization of care also plays a role in um, reproducing inequality within society, um, both between, particularly between different class groups, as we see in the case of Egypt. And with that, thank you very much. So I guess we can move on to the Q&A. Um, stop sharing. And I'll hand over to Adam again. Thank you, Bethana. Yes, um, we have uh, quite a few questions coming in. And just as a reminder, you can put questions um, into the Q&A uh, box on the, the lower thing of your screen. Um, so I will read the first one. Um, and it comes from uh, Camilla, who's a PhD student at the Autonomous University of Puebla in New Mexico. Um, they say, my question relates to the relationship between the ecological crisis and social reproduction crisis. Nancy Frazier understands them as separate, each responding to tensions between capitalist production and their respective domains. That is the social reproduction crisis as a order crisis that results from the tensions between capitalist production and social reproduction, while the ecological crisis is due to those same border tensions between production and its, ecolog and its ecological conditions of possibility. However, I feel a wider understanding of social reproduction as that suggested by the Kant's quote at the beginning of the presentation could encompass nature. How would you relate the crisis of social reproduction and the ecological crisis? Does the social reproduction lens help to understand ecological crisis? Thank you. So should I take uh, one question at a time? Is that okay? Yeah. yeah. So thank you so much. First of all, to Adam and Butena, and maybe if we have time later, I want to uh, share some thoughts also on what you have uh, uh, shared with all of us. Uh, but very briefly, I want to say that I am incredibly appreciative of the work that you as a PhD researchers are doing, which is very context specific. I think this is incredibly valuable to advance in uh, political economy research agenda. So, but maybe, you know, I will come back to some of the points that you raised later if there is time. So Camilla, thanks so much for your question. Um, I want to say a couple of things in uh, response to this question. The first uh, um, has to do with the notion of a crisis uh, of social reproduction, even before we get to, to the ecological crisis. Uh, um, because I think that uh, um, Nancy Fraser's framework uh, is incredibly powerful. Uh, at first, uh, she talks about a crisis tendency within capitalism. Um, and then, uh, you know, we have then quickly moved from the crisis tendency to be talking about a crisis. And I think that, uh, and you know, I am part of a group of uh, people who have often used uh, the notion of a crisis of uh, social reproduction, um, sort of taking for granted that this is happening because of uh, this, uh, in the intrinsic nature of uh, capitalism as a system that uh, destabilizes social reproduction essentially. Um, but actually, I want to say that uh, I think we might need to do a little bit more on this uh, and to unpack the notion of uh, crisis of social reproduction, um, because I think that there is a lot more to be said in terms of uh, what specific processes uh, lead to a situation of crisis. Uh, so are we saying that uh, we are living in a situation of chronic crisis of social reproduction, or are we living in a situation in which a crisis of social reproduction may might emerge uh, at uh, various points, uh, but there are specific processes that lead to it, uh, so to speak. And uh, lately I've begun to think that uh, it is more the case of the latter in that uh, there is always a risk that a crisis of social reproduction uh, will unfold, 
Um, but I think that uh, we need to do a lot more in order to understand uh, what uh, processes uh, underpin it, uh, beyond, uh, of course, uh, the broad process, which is uh, one of uh, systemic uh, uh, devaluation of uh, social reproduction within capitalism. Um, so actually, for those who have an interest in these issues, uh, I do think that it will be incredibly valuable to advance uh, this research agenda to uh, be looking at uh, the notion of crisis of social reproduction and the processes underpinning it, not only from a theoretical perspective, but also from an empirical perspective. And there's quite a lot more that needs to be said. But putting that on the side and coming to your question, which is really about ecological and social reproduction. So I'm not a, an expert uh, on uh, ecological crisis. Uh, so I don't want to you know, venture too much into the discussion of that. Uh, but uh, um, I have been reading with a lot of interest uh, the work by Stefania Barca, who is, to my knowledge, one of the few people who has uh, talked explicitly or explicitly began to draw the connections uh, between uh, social and ecological reproduction, um, where essentially those reproductive processes are not only about uh, the reproduction of human life and capitalist relations, uh, but they're also about uh, the reproduction of uh, the environment and natural resources and so forth. Um, and I find this uh, kind of idea incredibly appealing. Um, and uh, I do have uh, a PhD student who I'm not sure if he's here, but just to promote her work, uh, C.V. Lana, who is uh, working on these issues so from the perspective of informal work in particular on, in the African continent. Uh, um, and uh, uh, so based on my limited knowledge so far, I would say that uh, I, I, I think I agree with your point, uh, uh, which indeed, uh, uh, you know, if you want to, we can draw all the way back to syndicate's definition of social reproduction. That are, and I do think that there are um, very important synergies uh, that could be uh, really explored uh, to see not uh, the social reproduction crisis and the ecological crisis as separate, uh, but to really develop uh, an integrated framework uh, to understand the processes of uh, both social and ecological reproduction or the social and ecological conditions uh, of reproduction as a whole. So I hope that that provides an answer. Thank you. Okay, so we have another question, uh, which says it's from an anonymous uh, person. My question is twofold. One, is an ethic of care, as theorized by Toronto and Gil Gilligan, uh, at odds with the social reproduction lens? And the second part of it is, secondly, what are the conceptual and theoretical consequences Oops, sorry. What are the uh, conceptual and theoretical consequences of conflating care with social reproduction? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, great. Uh, so actually, thank you so much for this question to the anonymous participant. Uh, just before I answer this, uh, I also wanted to just to say that uh, the notion of ecological reproduction was something that I had very much in mind when you were talking, Adam, about your work. And I'm thinking not in the context of your PhD, but maybe going forward, uh, if these are areas uh, that you're interested in, maybe that could be quite a, a useful avenue to think about uh, how to bring together more systematically socioeconomic and uh, climate issues uh, in the context of your work. But sorry, so coming back to this question. Um, thank you so much. Um, it, is, uh, it, is a, it is a very important question that also maybe allows me to say a few words uh, uh, in relation to the theme that was raised by Butena on this uh, care versus social reproduction. Um, so the first thing I want to say is that uh, um, I'm not aware of uh, uh, a lot of work uh, that has begun to explore in a systematic way, let's say, um, what we mean by care, what we mean by social reproduction, are these two different things? Uh, do they have anything to do with one another? Is one a subset of the other one and so forth? Uh, but I think as uh, um, work uh, both on care and social reproduction becomes more delineated, uh, I think that uh, definitions uh, and different areas of intervention are probably becoming uh, uh, more uh, identifiable. Um, 
So while my hunch is that in the past, maybe there was uh, a lot more overlap uh, and uh, intersection, perhaps even some level of conflation in how these terminologies were used often interchangeably. Um, but on this, so I have uh, listened to a very uh, informative uh, seminar held uh, at the International Inequalities Institute at the LSE, um, where Sarah Farris was presenting on this topic, and it was uh, one of uh, the you know, most interesting uh, uh, engagements with, uh, with these questions. Uh, and uh, indeed, in that context, uh, she does uh, talk about uh, Toronto's work, uh, and probably also Gilligan, but I'm not too sure. Um, and then Emma Dowling has uh, engaged with this uh, in uh, her book, uh, Crisis of Care. Uh, very productively, and uh, just to put it out there that this is work in progress, so, but uh, with Alessandra Mezzade and Yu Ying Zhu here at SOAS, so we are looking systematically at how the feminist literature has used uh, these terminologies of care and social reproduction, so hopefully in the next uh, year or so, I don't know, there will be something that we will be able to write about this. Uh, but uh, so is the ethics of care at odds with social reproduction? Um, I think it's quite different in my understanding at least. Uh, and I do realize uh, that there might be some uh, disciplinary um, compartmentalizations uh, and differences uh, um, in that uh, uh, I think that uh, the social reproduction literature so far maybe has not engaged uh, very explicitly with uh, ethics of questions uh, as much as the literature on the ethics of care has. Um, and so I'm not sure whether they are at odds, but it seems to me that uh, the social reproduction literature, particularly as it is emerging uh, now, and uh, the ethics of care literature, um, intervene in quite different uh, areas uh, of uh, intellectual debate. Uh, um, and uh, I think I would need to reflect a little bit more whether I think that there are areas of uh, uh, synergy, uh, but I wouldn't say that they're necessarily at odds. Uh, I just see them as distinct. Um, so that's one. And then the second part was uh, on, uh, sorry, Butena, because I didn't, I wasn't quick enough to take notes. Uh, the conceptual and uh, theoretical. Yeah, so the second one is about the conceptual and theoretical consequences of conflating care and social reproduction. Yes, okay. So uh, I'm going to address this question from the perspective of how I understand the difference between social reproduction and care, which I think probably is quite similar to what Buthena alluded to earlier. And I do recognize that this is a perspective that comes mostly from political economy, I would say, where I see social reproduction as being something broader and care as being something more specific that has to do with the specific forms of work and practices that have to do with caring for others, uh, whether they're children, the elderly, or the sick. While social reproduction encompasses care, but also housework, it uh, encompasses production for uh, subsistence consumption or for own consumption, and also the sort of provision of education, healthcare, social care, and basic infrastructure. So this is my understanding of this. So if uh, uh, we go by these definitions, uh, I think that, uh, um, I mean, I, the problem, I think that the, uh, you know, there are not necessarily some uh, theoretical or conceptual contradictions, uh, um, or maybe they are actually, sorry, let me retract that. In fact, there are, because uh, I think that, uh, uh, these uh, uh, refer to, to uh, not different, but exactly care as a smaller set of uh, uh, work forms of work and practices. So in this sense, uh, um, uh, I think that it is important to have uh, perhaps uh, more clarity on what, uh, how we define uh, these uh, two things. Um, uh, because they are very much related from my perspective. They're not at odds with one another, 
uh, but uh, one is uh, uh, bigger than the other one from my perspective. But I do understand that from other disciplinary perspective, actually the picture might be reversed. But I do think that uh, the bottom line, which is that uh, we should define the two uh, very clearly, uh, remains uh, essentially. So, yeah. Thank you for that. Um, we have another one from Dylan Maxwell, a PhD student at SOAS. Um, they ask, is there a way to quantify the economic contribution of unpaid social reproduction labor given that the attendant, uh, the attendant use values don't command exchange value? Mm, yeah, hi Dylan, thank you so much for the question. So I'm, I'm conscious that maybe I've been a little bit too long-winded before, so I'm going to try to uh, you know, answer a little bit uh, uh, more concisely. Um, so, Actually, this is done. So feminists have done a lot of work uh, on how to account for uh, the uh, value or to quantify unpaid uh, social reproduction. And uh, I think that uh, the main way is to essentially, um, I mean, and I'm talking about, uh, you know, those exercises that are aimed at showing uh, the economic and social value of this work, and particularly accounting for the type of unpaid uh, household services that are outside of the calculation of GDP estimates, so how to bring them into exercises of uh, uh, national accounting, essentially. Um, and I think that uh, the one method that has been used uh, is to essentially uh, look at uh, what kind of uh, price is paid for the same type of service uh, if it were to be performed by somebody who's uh, hired in as a domestic worker, for example, or as a nanny, and then uh, quantify um, the value of uh, unpaid uh, social reproduction in that sense. Uh, although, you know, I'm aware that uh, this gets into, you know, like, uh, this uh, very important debate like on value and price uh, and so forth. Uh, but in a way, I do think that, uh, you know, the exchange value of how much of that service uh, basically uh, the sort of uh, exchange in the market, uh, um, as opposed to the use value, it is something that uh, has been thought about primarily through the method that I've just uh, shared with you. Um, yeah, I, and I think I'm going to leave it there, but perhaps, you know. This is a conversation to be continued. Okay, uh, thank you for that. So the next, so there are two questions by Ronald. Uh, the first question is, in Marx, is not social reproduction the recreation of labor capacity, not labor power? And the second question is, social reproduction occurs in all modes of production. How is it intrinsic in... Oh, how is it intrinsic to only one? Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you so much, Ronald. So to answer your questions directly. Um, so I think uh, um, the notion of uh, reproduction of uh, labor power. So I think in Capital Volume 1, actually, the language used by Marx is uh, uh, not social reproduction, but it's reproduction of labor power. And uh, of course, uh, this happens in uh, the context of uh, uh, the employment relationship. Uh, and this is the starting point uh, that feminists use to say, OK, there is that. But uh, of course, labor power is not only reproduced through having access to a wage, uh, but there are all of these other activities that take place uh, in the household. But as we see, not only that contribute to that uh, process of uh, social reproduction. Um, so that's one thing. And the second point, uh, which is uh, does social reproduction exist in all modes of production? Yes, I think so. Uh, because, you know, human life uh, is uh, reproduced in one way or in another. 
um, in the same way that uh, the relations uh, of uh, production in a particular mode of production, whether it's capitalism or something else, uh, it's always uh, something that needs to be reproduced. Uh, but I, I think that uh, the um, focus of uh, uh, social reproduction feminists uh, on uh, capitalism is because, of course, uh, we want to uh, historicize uh, this understanding in the context of the model of production that we currently have, um, because this type of analysis uh, cannot be done in universalizing ways, uh, but so you want to think about uh, specific historical moments uh, and uh, even specific uh, geographic locations, so which is what I hope I have tried uh, to at least uh, uh, point to in my presentation. Thank you. Um, next, uh, this is from uh, an anonymous uh, person. Uh, they asked not so much a question, but could you please talk a bit about the current crisis of social reproduction in the UK, which seems pretty severe, especially in relation to the NHS? Hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Um... I don't work in the UK. I only, I mean, I don't work on the UK. I work in the UK. <laughs> I live in the UK, but I don't work on the UK. So I always feel, I mean, of course I'm exposed. I read the news uh, like, and I connect uh, what I read in the news uh, with uh, my academic interests. Uh, but I always feel a little bit hesitant uh, when I am asked to talk about the UK in academic terms. Uh, um, I think, uh, you know, there are elements uh, of uh, a crisis, uh, potential crisis of social reproduction that uh, we're seeing in the UK that are actually in common with the, what we see uh, in this particular historical phase of capitalism in other contexts. Um, so I suppose, uh, you know, the global nursing crisis is uh, one example of that. Uh, but then, of course, and this is the importance of uh, focusing on uh, uh, specific regions, or specific countries, specific contexts in our analysis, uh, there are always uh, some uh, uh, context-specific determinants and processes that matter. Um, so I think what is going on with the NHS uh, is, uh, in, from some perspectives, quite complex, uh, but uh, from other viewpoints, uh, quite simple in that, uh, you know, this is a story, I think, of a government uh, that uh, for many years now has not been committed uh, to the public provision of uh, healthcare in the country. Uh, and so the underfunding of the NHS is a prime example of uh, a very key sector of social reproduction that uh, is being commodified. So we see the encroachment on cap of capital into healthcare provision. And, uh, you know, the shortages of uh, personnel and, uh, you know, the various other problems that the NHS faces uh, have been, uh, one might say, uh, you know, intentionally not addressed uh, in order to create a situation of chronic underfunding where there then who can uh, resorts or to the private provision of healthcare, or, you know, now I hear that so there are proposals uh, that would uh, ask uh, users of the NHS to uh, pay uh, to see a GP or, you know, so clearly, you know, I see also some critics uh, putting forward ideas uh, that uh, this is a very, it has been in the making for a long time, and it is part of uh, really neoliberalism as a sort of uh, uh, ideological project and beyond. Um, but it seems so that we are at a critical juncture in uh, this respect. Um, and then, of course, uh, there are uh, other issues that have to do with uh, the politics of uh, the UK that also have to do with uh, Brexit, for example, and as I was saying, uh, you know, the long rule of uh, the Conservative government um, that uh, probably exacerbate uh, quite substantially um, this uh, uh, situation of underfunding of uh, public healthcare provision. But this is something, so you see the underfunding of public healthcare provision is something that is happening in many contexts uh, across the North and the South. But then you have uh, specific contingent factors uh, that might make it worse uh, um, and that do matter substantially, I think. So 
don't take this as an exhaustive answer, but maybe these are just some reflections so, as somebody who lives in the UK. <laughs> Perfect. Um, so Valentina from University of Valparaiso uh, would like to know your views on the old debate on value and social reproduction, not the calculation you have already talked about. Thank you, Valentina. I was kind of hoping not to make it for this uh, session without having discussed this, but uh, clearly it didn't work. <laughs> but it is an important question. Um, it's a bit difficult for me to answer this question because uh, for some time uh, I wanted to uh, not take part uh, directly into this debate. Um, and I hoped that I could afford the possibility of being agnostic, uh, but clearly I can't. So I will say the following. Um, from the perspective of somebody who works uh, on, uh, you know, I'm going to talk about Mozambique, okay? So one of, for me, the primary reason why I um, bought into a social reproduction framework uh, uh, was that uh, I think that, you know, to put it very simplistically, as you move away from the core, so when you get to Mozambique, you are in the periphery of the periphery. So you're very far away from the core. The compartmentalization of the organization of capitalist life into you know, a clear set of uh, you know, the workplace uh, where you go like, and do your wage work, uh, and then the household where you do your uh, reproductive uh, uh, work uh, of care in the household, uh, and uh, the school, which is uh, where education is. So all of those compartmentalizations, uh, also in the organization of life, uh, generally speaking, um, become, you know, much more blurred. So, you know, all of these places uh, actually have very elusive boundaries, I think, uh, and uh, the type of organization of work and life on an everyday basis uh, is incredibly complex uh, and variegated. So in this sense, uh, if I connect this uh, to the debates on uh, value generation, I think I do have some sympathy with uh, Alessandra Mezzadri's argument uh, that it's a little bit difficult uh, to set apart uh, activities that are value generating from those uh, that are not or that might be, you know, more or less uh, directly or indirectly value generating. So don't take this as my definite answer. It is something that I am very much thinking about myself. Uh, but uh, for the reasons that I have uh, briefly outlined, uh, I do have some sympathy for those perspectives that see value generation also in activities that are normally not considered to be value generating. Um, yeah. I think. So we don't have any more questions from the audience. Um, oh, I just saw one come in. Uh, yes, uh, this is from uh, another anonymous uh, attendee, and they ask, what do you think about the prevalence of the term life-making in recent social reproduction theory writings? Does it leave out some important disciplinary aspects of social reproduction, e.g. through schools, police, etc., i.e., the reproduction of the worker as a worker, or as you put it earlier, the reproduction of life as work. Okay, thank you. Um, so I think uh, that uh, I don't use uh, very much of this language of life making versus profit making, um, because I do see social reproduction as being very much enmeshed uh, in uh, the two in uh, some ways. Uh, or, you know, I see it more as a spectrum. So I see, you know, things as being a little bit more nuanced and complicated. But I do think that uh, the scholars who use the language of life making, which is very powerful, actually, because uh, it is something, you know, one problem perhaps with social reproduction is that 
you know, like it is a bit of a clunky terminology. So people are never quite sure what that actually means, uh, like, and what is included in social reproduction and whatnot. So, so I see how the language of life making activities is much more direct, and I think people, you know, immediately get an idea of what that means. So, but I do think that, for example, when Hiti Bhattacharya uses the language of life making, actually the activities that you mentioned, such as school, but uh, I mean, police is a bit of more of a, um, you know, I, I'm not sure, yeah, I don't want to, you know, talk for Titi Bhattacharya, but I think that uh, school and educate, the provisioning of education would definitely be considered to be a life making activity. Um, so I don't think that you need to think of uh, those views uh, as uh, uh, being about uh, the, you know, the sort of uh, the reproduction biologically of human life, uh, but it's a uh, life making in this very broad sense. Uh, and indeed, uh, uh, Hidi Bhattacharya in uh, that edited volume that has become the go-to book for social reproduction theory starts uh, with uh, the question that uh, social reproduction theory is about uh, asking uh, what uh, activities and what forms of work uh, reproduce uh, the worker so that she's ready every day to go to work. And so it is, uh, it is a much broader understanding of uh, life making in that sense, uh, if I understood this question correctly, yeah. Okay, perfect. Uh, so there seems to be no more questions. I think Costa has his hand up. I have yes. a question. Okay. Um, okay. Thank you for this, Sarah. Very, very informative as expected. Uh, I have um, uh, have a lot of sympathy for social reproduction uh, theory. The approach it goes back to the very foundations of uh, political economy and the use of reproduction as uh, as the organizing principle uh, of looking at uh, society. Um, so. I appreciate very much your presentation and placing it in historical context. Now, while you were doing that, though, and you were talking about it, I've been trying to get my head around the idea of a social reproduction crisis mm. and what it might mean, you see, because we use the term and it sounds OK, um, but what might it mean? You see, um, when Marx talks about the crisis of reproduction of labor power, which he does in Das Kapital, I understand what it means. Um, almost a biological inability of labor power to reproduce itself because capital encroaches upon every hour of the day and um, basically kills labor. And unless the state intervenes, there is no balancing by capital itself. There is no, there is no reproduction that comes from the system itself. Someone's got to do it from the outside. Someone's got to, it's an, it's, it's an external imposition uh, on, on, the, on the economic logic of capital. That I understand. But a crisis of social reproduction, what could it be? Is it a, a crisis in care work? Does this include a crisis in unpaid work within the family? Does it include a crisis in domestic um, labor? Is it a crisis in health provision? Is it a crisis in education provision? Well, all these things are social reproduction. It, and if it is all these things, then what is it? What's the specificity of such a crisis? Because these are very different things uh, in their own um, uh, logic and operation. So yeah. what is the crisis of social reproduction? How would you approach it? And how would you uh, formulate it? Yeah, thank you so much, Kostas. I mean, I think that this is a great question. Um, so I think that so far in a lot of scholarship, uh, the crisis of social reproduction refers uh, exactly, precisely to all of the above, you know, like all of the things uh, that uh, you have mentioned, uh, um, which I think, I mean, in a way I find it uh, useful in a broad sense uh, because uh, yes, of course, uh, capital encroaches on everything and fundamentally you know, like, uh, the end point is uh, the immiseration of labor and uh, you know, like uh, there are also, uh, Marx also engages uh, with uh, uh, the poor health uh, and nutrition of workers. So, you know, like, so clearly there is a process of uh, overall depletion that affects uh, all labor. Um, but I think uh, 
And again, you know, I don't think that this can be attributed only to feminists, but feminists certainly have made, uh, you know, uh, a point about uh, the fact that uh, it is about uh, how the different uh, forms of work uh, are valued differently or in fact uh, are devalued. And so the one thing that uh, brings together all of uh, the social reproduction and, uh, um, you know, in that sense, I think uh, it is okay to talk about a crisis, uh, a socially reproductive crisis tendency is that these are the activities that are either completely devalued, as in the case of unpaid forms of social reproduction, or they are underpaid. So they have been systematically devalued. And indeed, it's, by no, it's no coincidence that there are specific social groups, women, migrants, black and brown people, and so forth, who are overrepresented in these undervalued or devalued activities, right? Um, so in this sense, I can take, I mean, you know, I think it's fine to think about a crisis tendency in all of this, right? So this is a story of uh, essential work uh, to some extent, right? So during the COVID-19 pandemic, certain forms of work have been declared, uh, have been designated as essential. And it was uh, all of a sudden clear that a lot of uh, very low paid uh, jobs uh, that are performed in very poor working conditions uh, are carried out by specific social groups. And in fact, these people are paid very little, but they were the ones who had to continue to go to work while everybody else could either work from home or even lose their jobs, right? So it is about uh, you know, this uh, overall story. That being said, I completely, I think, agree with you that uh, we need a little bit more in order to unpack that story of, uh, I mean, in fact, it's not only a little bit, uh, we need a lot more to unpack uh, the story of a crisis of social reproduction. And I think that there is a lot of scope uh, to analyze uh, uh, also empirically, uh, but of course, uh, then bringing it back to theoretical questions, uh, what specific processes uh, underpin uh, points of crisis uh, in different domains of social reproduction. So for example, I'm very interested, and this is work that is just beginning now, in drawing some connections uh, between uh, food and social reproduction and how the deterioration in uh, the quality of diets uh, uh, might be linked to processes so that can lead to a crisis of social reproduction in this respect, in that they generate uh, you know, a number of non-communicable uh, diseases and so on and so forth. Um, but it is, uh, you're pointing to, I think, an issue that uh, requires uh, more uh, engagement. Uh, yeah, thank you. Can I push it a little bit more? Yes. Can I move in a little bit into a sort of uh, an area that could be potentially dangerous? Hmm. We're talking about social reproduction. Uh, social reproduction of a, of a, a group of humanity, basically, right? Uh, in particular countries. Now, population is a clear sign of social reproduction and ability socially to reproduce uh, that group of humanity. There are other, there are other dimensions, but population is one of them. Uh, arguably a very important thing. Could we take population contraction as a sign of uh, crisis social re reproduction? And I'm thinking here of, say, southern Mediterranean countries or southeastern Mediterranean countries, including Italy, Greece, and so on, where the ability of the population to reproduce itself um, is uh, not evident. So can we can we think of that? Uh, is that acceptable? Is that, uh, how would you to begin to tackle that? Hmm. I mean, I never thought about this before. It's very interesting. So take my response in a very tentative way. It's just, I'm thinking off the top of my head. Um, I mean, yeah, I mean, I think that there is something in the Southern European countries uh, that definitely has to do with uh, um, the barriers uh, to the processes of social reproduction that underpins uh, why people have uh, very few children or in fact, no children at all. I think that there is uh, something definitely along those lines. Uh. Um, so, I mean, in the same way, 
maybe it is out there and I've missed it, so, but I think that it would be very interesting to analyze uh, China's one child policy from a social reproduction lens uh, and thinking about uh, questions of uh, labor supply that apparently have been uh, a key issues uh, in that context. Uh. Um, I'm a little bit more hesitant uh, in, uh, I mean, I want to be very clear that I want to stay away from uh, the sort of debates on uh, demographic issues uh, and particularly Malthusian views so that I think are very dangerous. It goes to Malthus. <laughs> Yeah, no, but it cannot go there because what we're saying is in fact almost the opposite, right? That uh, if people cannot uh, biologically reproduce themselves, so this is a sign of crisis. So, uh, you know, and, you know, Malthus said all sorts of racist and uh, classist views. So, so we want to not to engage with him, I think. <laughs> but it is well, we want to engage with him, but not just... <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I don't know. <laughs> Maybe I don't want to engage with him, but fine. <laughs> Um, yeah, I think uh, that's it. Yeah, I think shall we call it a day? Yes. <laughs> yeah, I'm not seeing uh, any more questions um, in the box or, or on YouTube. So yeah. So I don't know who. Um, shall I just say? Yeah, yeah, no, I'll, 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 I'll wrap it up. Uh, thank you very much, Sarah. Thank you very much to uh, Adam and Butaina. This was, um, uh, this was actually the, the very penetrating and detailed uh, discussion, uh, probably the most detailed discussion we've had since, uh, and presentations since uh, the beginning of this uh, uh, series. Um, I mean, obviously it had to do with the quality of Sarah's presentation, but also the quality of the interventions. Um, I hope that we'll continue along uh, the same lines uh, in the weeks to come and really go in depth uh, into questions and ask dangerous questions and deal with dangerous subjects. So um, uh, thank you very much to all of you. Uh, thank you to all those who've attended the, the session. And uh, see you uh, again soon. I believe the next session is next week uh, because of a change of dates. Um, and uh, on we go. Thank you. Thank you so much, Costas and Adam and Butena and all of the organizers. So it was very nice. And I want to continue the conversations with Adam and Butena offline. <laughs>